Um, we, you know, as, as museum people, I would say um, there's quite a few of us in this group. We, we've been talking a lot um, about how we look at our collection or during times like this for inspiration, um, for the tough questions, for context, maybe even for comfort. And one of the areas that we immediately thought about in the collection was work that we have dealing with the AIDS pandemic. Um, it's, a, it's a building area, area of our collection. It's by no means, no means comprehensive. Um, but I think it, it's certainly at the front of our minds because it was just, it was in fact just one month ago when we, when we acquired a painting by General Idea that some of you may have actually seen up at PATH. It's been up since the fall, I believe, in, our, um, in one of our galleries. So AIDS is certainly a different thing. Uh, there's a different, there was a different type of stigma attached to it, certainly when it, when it happened than COVID-19. Um, but Monica and I both think that there's certain ways that, that art intersects with this issue in, in ways that we can think about today. And we hope that you'll, you'll join us um, in the discussion. So I'm going to give a super brief introduction to, to General Idea and the painting that we recently acquired by them. And then Monica is going to do a brief introduction on Suko, and then we'll toss out some questions to each other, to all of you, mm -hmm. um, and we'd love to hear from you. Cool. So I'm going to share my screen with you. And you can now see our new, what I'm calling our <laughs> Path of Pores logo. <laughs> um, which hopefully you'll see again. But I want to start with with this painting, this work by General Idea. And we did, in fact, I, I remember presenting this to the collections committee and some of you are in fact here. And so I thank you for, for bringing this really important work into the collection. Because really it was the day before we all found out that we would be working from home that we presented this to the committee for acquisition. So I remember even sort of goosebumps popping up in my arm as I was talking about this piece. Um, it's a piece by a collective called General Idea. Um, it's the paintings called Great AIDS Ultramarine Blue and it's dated from 1990 and 2019. And to give you a sense of scale, it's about 10 feet by 10 feet. So it's, it's quite large. Uh, for those of you that don't know, General Idea is a Canadian, Canadian collective that was founded in 1969. Um, there were three people involved, A.A. A. Bronson, uh, Jorge Zontel, and Felix Parts. Uh, those are names that they took, they took when founding the collective. Apologies, my dog just came in from a walk. <laughs> um, but they, uh, so they, they made work across media, posters, videos, um, painting, certainly, installation, performances. And they used appropriation, humor, and, and irony quite a bit to talk about that intersection between art and commerce, the role of the artist in the museum, um, and certainly body politics, queer theory, and AIDS. So this is an image of, of the collective um, as part of a body of work that they did on, on the drug AZT. So this is, this, is what, this is one of their iconic works. From the, from the late 1980s really forward through the early 1990s, they focused on the HIV AIDS pandemic. And they did a body of work that they would later call image virus, um, which it was, again, this, these wall, this type of wallpaper, paintings, installation, um, posters that were spread all, all around town. Um, and it's interesting to think, because I went back and looked today because um, we talk about a lot about how our president has had an effect on, on this pandemic and how it's perceived. And it wasn't until 1985, um, after approximately 5,500 to 6,000 people had died from AIDS, that Reagan finally said the word in public, finally acknowledged this epidemic that was affecting so many people. And of course, this work was inspired by Robert Indiana's love sculpture. Um, they did their first, General Idea did their first AIDS painting in 1987, and they used this same um, red-blue color pattern that you see in this early in Indiana sculpture that's, that's cited in New York. And they were really interested in the cultural and commercial currency of Indiana sculptures, because as ubiquitous as it is now, certainly in Philly, we've got one um, right, in center, right in Center City, it was just as ubiquitous then. It was on napkins, it was all over the place. And so they wanted to really take advantage of that image and bring awareness to AIDS. So um, there's a great uh, statement that A.A. A. Bronson made saying that it played the part of the virus itself. 
And our painting, Pafis painting was done, um, was inspired by the great love painting that Robert Indiana did, which is this kaleidoscope, kaleidoscope type of image. Um, you will notice going back to ours, um, this is, and everyone has heard me say this quite a few times, but this is general idea meets general George Washington. This is us, this is us putting the AIDS crisis right in the center of American history and, and really giving it, giving it its importance, I, I hope people see. But you'll notice that the painting has two dates, 1990 and 2019. Uh, sadly, Jorge Zontel and Felix Parts passed away in the early 90s, 90s of AIDS, leaving, leaving A.A. Bronson. Um, so the work was conceptualized then, but realized um, just in this last year by A.A. By a. Bronson. And they talked about how this kaleidoscope, using, making the letters into this kaleidoscope image, it was almost like it was metastasizing, that this disease was spreading. And I, Monica, I'm going to let Monica take it off here with Sue Co. So I should stop sharing my screen, right, Monica? Yes, in theory, that is what we want to do here. Um, it's, and it's really interesting how different, I think, the works in our collection that Jody and I also both gravitate to in this scenario are from each other. Um, and the ways in which these artists are addressing the same topic, but in just massively different ways. So um, I'm, I'm, I have a particular affinity and love for the artist Sue Ko. Um, I think partly because I met her very early in my career and she is a force of nature as a personality. And so, um, you know, she just, I don't know, she converted me very early. Um, and for those of you who are not aware of um, Sue Ko's background, she is a British born artist. So she has made the United States her home for several decades. She lives in upstate New York. Um, and she's usually referred to as an activist artist, although I will point out that she does not like being called a political artist or an activist artist. Activist and artist work for her, but not as a joint phrase. And her preferred descriptor is um, as a visual journalist, which I think is an important note because it tells you sort of why she does what she does. Um, but she's very well represented in Pathless Collection uh, in a number of ways. And we have two different works of hers uh, that I wanted to bring to this conversation. The first one um, is this. This is uh, a piece uh, from what is actually called the AIDS Suite from 1994. And it's very in line with what she does. It's worth noting um, that her entire art career has been spent documenting the marginalized. Incarcerated women, animals in slaughterhouses, the politically oppressed, um, and of course people living with and dying from HIV and AIDS. So this, uh, this is very much in her body of work. Um, and in 1994 she was actually invited to the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston by a friend and a colleague who was also a psychiatrist and an activist who was doing an art project there um, in collaboration with the Institute for the Medical Humanities. And so she was actually allowed into the AIDS ward in Galveston, Texas, where if you will recall, back then family members weren't actually even allowed into those wards on a lot of occasions. Um, or partners couldn't, certainly if you were um, unmarried, which you were if you were gay back in the 90s. So she had entree into this world that a lot of people actually did not get to see. And she drew these really beautiful moving portraits you can see of the environment in which she's working, um, but also very much um, chronicling what was happening in the lives of the patients that she met. So you of course couldn't take cameras in because that would have violated privacy laws, but by doing drawings, um, she was actually allowed to participate in their lives to know people and they could approve or not approve the images that she was using. And one of the things that I think is, is so interesting in the way that she is trying to bring compassion to the situation, if you can see it here on the screen, she notes in her title, in her notes for the works, not just what they're made out of, when they're made and the title of them, but she gives you the actual healthcare status of the person whose portrait she's doing. 
So in this one, this is Tony uh, line etching. She's actually indicated on the portrait of this particular patient. This is Tony, age 26, white, gay, T cell count 34, generalized weakness, diarrhea, temperature 39.5, diagnosed December 93, lost 40 pounds in one month, a quarter of his body weight. 1994, Galveston, Texas. So all of that information to her is part of the portrait of this moment in a crisis that she is trying to uh, humanize in a, in a really interesting way, I think. Um, she did some of her portraits multiple times, so she still has the original sketches, and sometimes you'll see something like Gary's last portrait, as in the last portrait before Gary passed away. Um, so also noting where in the life cycle of her sitters, the relationship that she formed with them happened. Um, which I just find, um, I find it all very moving. But one of the things that I think differentiates the way Sue Ko went about this work from um, some other folks at the time is she was also very much interested in building empathy for the healthcare workers, not unlike the um, you know, the campaigns that you see going on now to make sure people understand how big a deal it is to be on the front lines of healthcare in the United States right now. Back then, they also did not have uh, personal protective equipment. Most of the healthcare workers treating AIDS victims, even into the 90s, are doing so on a volunteer level um, because there's no cure. So you are at a very high risk by doing this work. And she really wanted to sort of lionize that gift of empathy that healthcare workers bring. So here you can see um, one of her works. This is Kaposi sarcoma. Um, and what you actually see is a portrait of Dr. Avery, her friend and activist, the psychiatrist on this particular AIDS ward, giving a massage to the patient because it is so rare in cases like these, as in cases like today, um, that in the late stages of these diseases, you actually have physical contact. And that the, the steps that these healthcare workers are taking to make this experience human was worth capturing for her in a moment of visual journalism um, in, in a lot of ways. And this is the one um, that is sticking with me right now. It's the one that I talked about with our colleagues at the Smart History organization recently, um, actually for an AP history course that Anna and I did with them. Um, because this comes a little bit, uh, this is a separate piece entirely from the AIDS suite, but this is Sue Ko's um, photo etching called AIDS Won't Wait. The enemy is here, not in Kuwait. And I think it is a really interesting piece that helps us think through the resources that we as a country have to bear on various types of crises and the ways in which we make those choices. Right, so she's doing this when we are somehow still not dealing with the healthcare crisis that is the HIV AIDS epidemic in the United States, but we are sending um, trillions of dollars worth of military equipment and personnel to the Gulf War. And how, as a community with finite resources, do we make choices like that? Um, and this is really resonating for me right now. I don't know what the rest of you are hearing in your communities and your networks, but I have a lot of, of friends who are sort of going, hmm, it's interesting that we can't fix public education or provide everyone with basic health care or build enough roads to get around or have safe drinking water in all of our towns. But somehow we found $2 trillion in a couple of days. Uh, and that's because of choice. That's because we chose to find it. Um, and so I find this particular piece of Suko is really powerful in reflecting that we're in another moment that is a crisis moment, but a crisis is dealt with through a series of choices. Um, and how we move forward together is gonna be based on which of those choices we make in which ways. Um, so I could say many, many more things about Suko, but those are the works that I wanted to sort of um, put on the table, because uh, they're also very, very different than general idea, I think, in, in which uh, she's using graphic elements and illustration and almost a cartoonish realism in the way that she's doing her work, which is very different than their use of the commercial patterning and, and merchandising tropes. Yes. May I ask a question? You may. So you, you said that, that Suko thought of herself as an activist, right? 
Yes. Which right there, that's because so, I was re rereading some quotes from General Idea today, and they, they did not think of themselves as activists, mm -hmm. which is just right there an interesting contrast between the two. And one, yeah. could, one I, I don't know, looking at the work, my, one might actually think it's the opposite. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, well, and she doesn't, she hates the phrase political art, but she's right. fine to be an activist. Now, I think that also has cert a certain amount to do with the way that she lives her life, uh, which is that if she is not making art, she is engaged in an act of activism. I mean, the woman's breaking into slaughterhouses to free the animals. Um, and it's reflected in her art sometimes, but I think sometimes that's just an act in and of itself self that she's going to engage in. So I think she recognizes herself as performing both of those acts. She does activism and she does art making. Um, and it's interesting, um, on the other side of this, when we get to mount exhibitions again at the museum and invite you all to come and see them, we have such an extraordinary collection of Suko's work in our permanent collection. We have the AIDS suite, we have uh, AIDS Won't Wait, but we have a whole series of her slaughterhouse works, we have a series of works she did um, around the Anita Hill trial. So, and some of them have been gifts. Some of them have been acquired by different curators, but she has spoken to a lot of curators of Papa over the years. So we have a very rich collection, dozens, I think, at this point. So I'm excited to see her come out on the other side of this crisis again. Um, all right, so now, before Jody and I stop sort of telling you about two of our favorite artists in the collection, I, I want to echo what Abby and Jody both said, which is that we want you to also answer questions and participate in this because this is, this is not meant to be a lecture, right? This is meant for us to have a conversation with you and I'm going to keep drinking my wine while I do it. So it's going to, it's going to get interesting. Um, but here's my first question for Jody, but then also the rest of you. I don't know if any of you have seen the same articles that I have, but starting about two weeks ago, I saw more than one news outlet publish an article or an op-ed along the lines of, yes, we know you're all trapped at home now, but no, it's not time for your COVID-19 short story, rock opera, painting, sculpture, whatever. This idea that we're in the middle of a thing, we don't need everybody and their brother to suddenly self-anoint themselves artists, it's too soon. And I guess like, on a certain level, I kind of get that. We're in the middle of something, what does it all mean? We're still figuring it out. But on the other hand, what is that? I don't, <laughs> why are we so afraid of the idea of people taking advantage of creativity as a response to crisis? Like what, as I said to Jody earlier today, I mean, maybe you're right, maybe they won't all go into museums. Um, but let's say that uh, a year from now, all of the MFA art shows are filled with coronavirus, you know, self-portraits of quarantine and museums are mounting exhibitions uh, where we do I don't know, works about healthcare. What is the problem? Why, is, why are we so afraid of this? Why are we doing this sort of punitive limitation of creativity um, while people are finding it both therapeutic and professionally rewarding? What do you think that is, Jody? Well, I mean, I, I think it's actually based on the, 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 the J world, the judgment world in the art, the judgment word in the art world, in that we have to always decide whether something is good art or bad art. And when I was thinking about this, I went back and read, because I don't know, like maybe in 2015 or so, there was, there was a group of, of exhibitions that toured the country and were in New York about, about the AIDS um, pandemic in the, in the late 80s and 90s. And so Holland Cotter wrote an article in the New York Times talking about how, well, geez, it's about time, 30 years later that this is finally happening. And one of the things that he said that, that um, struck me, I guess, was saying to, to to the theory heavy art establishment, the AIDS crisis brought back politics, spirituality, and personal emotion as aesthetic content. And I think that's what we grapple with in the art world all the time. Because emotion, uh, mm -hmm. healing, which I'm hoping is something that we can, we can talk about a little today. Um, there's, there's a great fear of that in the art world for some reason. Like, and I'm, I'm all for thinking of obviously scholarship and, and being intellectual mm -hmm. about art. 
Um, but I think that's what it's about. It's about someone taking this, this moment to heal themselves through making or just to express themselves through making versus, versus us judging whether that is a good or bad um, art object. And to me, it feels like the, the, art, the art made right now in this moment will certainly be different than the art made in a year or five years about this moment. Mm -hmm. And that will be really interesting to see. You That's know, how and why, how and why, how, how and why those things shift as time goes on. I mean, that, that's my thought on it. It's what you just said, that fear of the feeling, that fear of using something to heal or art as, as a process like that for the, the maker. So interesting to me because I was thinking about Felix Gonzalez Torres as mm -hmm. we were preparing for this conversation, which makes sense, a, a very important artist from, not just from the moment that the AIDS epidemic swept the, commu the art community and the world at large, but whose work responded to it very personally. Um, but one of the things that he said was, I wanna make art that makes people take action. Making them feel something is too easy. And I, I think, so it's an interesting juxtaposition, I guess, in terms of also who's getting to decide what is the important intention of the making and the receiving, because you've definitely got artists that would say making, just making people feel something like Felix is, it's not enough. I want them to like make, take a political stance or I want them to act. It's fascinating. That, that um, right, that feeling's not enough, even though feelings could lead to actions. Mm -hmm. ways, I think that's what Sue, Sue Coe's work does, right? It makes me feel so oh, yes. visceral in my chest. And she's very upfront about it. She says, I, I can't make you act. All I can do is show you the world as I've seen it. Um, so I can show you the interior of a slaughterhouse. I cannot show you something that tells you to be a vegan, but I can show you the interior of a slaughterhouse. And then sort of going at this moment after my visual journalism, this this moment is yours to make decisions about as you see fit, if that makes sense. Um, we also have a question from Laurel that we should respond to, which was asking about the reception of Suko's AIDS-related works from the 90s and then the current reception for General Idea in the Caddis show at PAFA. Um, so I, what I can't tell you is what you might have read about Suko's work in the 90s, because I was not reading art criticism in the 90s, I'm afraid to tell you. But what I do know is that all of the exhibitions that I have seen of that particular body of work for her, they have been in the aughts. They have been since 2013, 2014. Um, I've seen those, the AIDS suite shown multiple times in the last 10 years. Um, at places like Yale, but also at medical institutions. Um, so it has staying power, but she has also pretty much, I think her entire career, always been criticized for being too political. Um, not, not that she isn't artful, but that the, the thing people take away from her work tends to be the politics. Now, what would you say about General Idea at PAFA? I, the, the response to the show, the, and the show that, that Laurel's referring to is a, is a partnership that we did with the Caddis Foundation called Ancient History of the Distant Future. And it was about contemporary artists that are in some ways looking at art history in their work. So we tried to do a, a double whammy, I guess, with the, with the general idea painting. As in, it was referring to the Robert Indiana sculpture that's just a few blocks away from PAFA. But we also placed it within our portraiture gallery where, where you know, you've got the Peel family, you've got these artists that, that founded PAFA and, and many people that were frankly involved at the beginning, at the beginning of this, this country. So, and then I showed you the image of it situated between the two uh, George Washington portraits. And so when we cited it there, we were, we were really wanting to make that intervention in American, in American history. Um, something that, you know, I mean, I, I can't say this for a fact, but in the 90s in museums, I don't think many museums were really talking about AIDS um, and, and many places at all. So the fact that we put this in, in what is one of our most important spaces, I would say, in the historic landmark mm -hmm. building, this kind of Washington foyer area, I think um, delighted some <laughs> and, and others probably had other feelings about it, frankly. 
uh, frankly, to be completely honest, when it went up in the wall and I stepped back and I, and I knew what it was, obviously I knew what it was going to look like. I went, Oh my Lord. Like it even to me felt like it was like, Whoa, we're really, Oh my gosh, we're doing this. But it also made me take a step back and think, boy, why th there's some stigma for me with AIDS too. Then if I'm thinking about why is it, why is it um, beyond aesthetically strange uh, to have this general idea painting here? What does it mean to me that I find it shocking? And so um, I don't, you know, we weren't trying to necessarily shock viewers, but I, but I hope it, it did jar them into thinking about how, how AIDS has been ignored, has or has mm -hmm. not been ignored in, in American history and, and art history and museums. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you, Laurel. Yeah. So it, um, it makes me want to make a little segue uh, because I'm, I'm looking at the list of people who are on this call and we are, we are an institution heavy group of art world professionals on this call. We've got a lot of curators and educators and collectors. And I think to the point that you just made, I, my understanding is that it's not so much that we, uh, that museums didn't notice the AIDS crisis, but that they were actively complicit in not wanting those conversations about queerness and disease to happen inside their walls. Yes. Um, and A.A. And A. A. Bronson even made the point that part of the, the point of their image virus series was to use the museum for just mm -hmm. that. And he talked about how, you know, in the 90s, the museum, museums were just really becoming public spaces. We were thinking more mm -hmm. about our audiences, more about community. And they took advantage of that moment in, in, a, way to, in a way to phrase it. Um, to, to bring awareness to this disease. Things were becoming perhaps less ac academic in some places and more focused on the community. Mm -hmm. So they use that to, to propel the, the image, that AIDS mm -hmm. image. Well, and obviously this moment's gonna be a little bit different, right? Because this is affecting the arts institutions from the beginning and at, at a place that's, that's very specific to where we're going to go from here, our future, because it's, it's also affecting the economics of being an art institution, right? So this is going to be dealt with differently, I think. But one of the things that I was thinking about with institutions is if you look back at the 80s, and if you just take New York, um, you know, in the early 80s, you had, at least in the East Village, this rising community of, of artists starting galleries there i think there were 176 i had to look up the number because obviously i don't always just know that but there were 176 small diverse collaborative art galleries that had sprung up in the east village sort of as a counter conversation to the bigger art world right and by the end of the 80s 176 of them had closed uh, wiped out partly by the AIDS crisis and then partly by on the other side of that um, appropriation by uptown galleries that survived moments of, of crisis, political, economic, and artistic. And so one of the things that I'm thinking about right now is what the, it felt to me like right before the coronavirus, institutions in the United States had started to evolve in a really interesting direction. Again, a more diverse direction, a more open uh, direction, uh, a more collaborative and partnership-based direction. We had artists forming you know, communities where they were actually economically supporting each other as collectives and businesses. Are these moments of evolution and these places of collaboration and diversity going to be able to exist on the other side of this? And what's that going to mean for artistic production? Like right when we were almost there. Um, this is what keeps me awake at night. That's a question for everybody too. Yeah. I mean, what do we think it's what do we think institutionally are going to be the infrastructures that that make it on the other side of this where we can look to that work to continue or are we going to regress? Looks like Joan has her hand raised. I think I can unmute you, Joan. Mm -hmm. Try. Yeah. There uh, you go. There you go. 
I, I got my lovely Google Banks uh, background up finally. Yeah. So everyone should take a deep breath and walk along the water. <laughs> um, you know, I have being old enough to have lived through the whole AIDS crisis. There's a couple, a couple things that are a little bit different. I mean, for a while, there there were two phases of how people reacted. The first was when people were fearful everywhere when they thought AIDS was contagious uh, through the air, which is more like what we're feeling today. And then when the science caught up, it the reactions for most people felt a little bit different because they thought, okay, I can practice, uh, you know, some safe practices and I'll be fine. But right now, you know, the fear is nobody knows what to do other than um, social caring, uh, as Einstein Healthcare Network calls it. Social caring sounds so much nicer than social distancing. But what I wonder about now in reactions and in the art world in the future uh, for those of us who love the museum and will be interested in seeing this art, will we just be, um, you know, East Coast, East Coast elites who are interested in art? I mean, there is a, such a very different political dimension now to what's happening where there are people who believe the science and people who don't. And it is just so position to divide this country politically even more deeply that I wonder if the art, how the art in the future of this moment is going to reflect that divide. A lot of layers of complexity. I mean, it's interesting just to quickly say something before I, I grab Brooke's hand. Um, the, it's interesting to think how I think the work made about AIDS is still received in a politically divided way today. Like I think that the different sides would have a different reaction to, 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 the, to the work made 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago even, which is interesting. Just a second, Joan, let me unmute you again. Myself. There I you go. That. I mean, there is still a political difference, but it, it's, that's still just a very liberal point of view and New York is a very liberal community. But there's an element here to denying what's happening now that I, I just find it so hard to wrap my arms around denying that they're what the scientists say and saying everything's going to be fine in two weeks and maybe we should open the beaches the, the whole denigration of intellectual thought includes the arts and I wonder I'm just wondering I, I have no idea how this will be reflected in the future Brooke? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Jody. Um, uh, Joan, first of all, tomorrow you're going to have to tell me how to get that background because that is just super cool. And I'm new to Zoom for the last two weeks, like everybody else on the planet, but I've not seen that utilized by anyone. So I love it. Um, I want to tease out two things between Monica and Jody, who are to my left and my right in my grid. Um, and um, Monica, I want to just pick a little bit at that article that you brought up because um, I found it uh, not as provoking as I think it wanted to be because I think it existed to provoke. It was one of those headlines that um, uh, and I'm going to probably show my generation, but it feels like one of those headlines that's looking to get a lot of tweets uh, uh -huh. by publishing itself. Clickbait. So I felt a little um, uh, aggravated by the uh -huh. cynicism that I felt just in the, the approach that it took or even the, what it was wanting to say, because here's what we all know in this Zoom conversation, all 30 of us or so we're not going to be able to tell artists what to do. Uh, you can't tell artists that they, you know, it's too soon to address this topic or you never should address this topic or you're going to address it in this manner and not that manner. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a little, it just felt more cynical and grabby of headlines, if you'll pardon me saying it mm -hmm. like that, than actually um, having substance and, um, and also kind of generosity towards the experience that we're all going through. And interestingly, if we take that article, and it might be fun for Abby if she can find it. I just tried to, but I didn't have a lot of luck on my phone. 
to post it some if we could post it as a link so that we can mm. facilitate the conversation but it's interesting to have that article out there and being circulated by our by our community at the same time that there are more articles about how if we do nothing it is imperative that we support the creative sector now if we do nothing it's important that we find ways to help artists get through this period of time now if we do nothing it's important that we acknowledge the role that artists have in helping us get through this very difficult time and so i find that this and that the the that and the this to be in total conflict and i think we all know where pafa sits in this uh choice and and certainly many of us on the in the conversation of giving voices to the artists and letting them tell us if it's too soon to address COVID-19. Um, I can't imagine when people are talking about this being our generations or this time's World War II that we're not going to have a lot of creative production around the experience of being so isolated. The only person I've touched for the last three and a half weeks is my husband. And that's wild to imagine that I haven't been able to interact with anyone else in this period of time. That's something we're all going to want to be able to talk about and express and understand. And the artists, I think, are going to help us get to understanding that better because it's still we still have several more weeks uh if not months to go so i'm, I'm really glad you brought that article up because it agitated me <laughs> <laughs> and and i kind of wanted to you know i i, I resist it i deny it i i just don't want to give it um real agency to be honest um, and then you brought something else that I thought, uh, I think we're going to continue to talk about in, in the ways that we gather as a, as a audience at PAFA and as a community um, through PAFA. And it is this thing that I am most fearful about, and that's the retraction of attention to artists who are finding that they're finally getting recognition from the mainstream art world and, the, and that sector of the art world. I think of Jody's work um, uh, that's been so exemplary around uh, collecting and exhibiting work by women who are more mature, who are older, who are, you know, plus 65, and how that is a hot market right now, um, uh, hotter than it's ever been before. And I'm concerned that our gaze is going to be redirected as institutions that have supported women, artists of color, um, and other perhaps overlooked artists by the mainstream art world, I wanna be clear about that, um, that, uh, that the glance goes elsewhere. And I'm, I'm committed to figuring out how we at PAFA, through the resources and the talent, I think all of our curators are on this call right now, what we can do to assure that we don't um, take our gaze away from our priorities, our stated priorities. Yeah. So I suspect we probably, most of us here have a certain shared value system around art and the value of creativity in our communities. Um, but I will, I will say two things um, about why I brought that article up and still want to discuss it. It agitates me too, Brooke. I'm <laughs> sure you know that. But one of those things is, um, so in the interest of transparency, we actually got a tweet about our listings for these programs, for this program specifically. Um, and we got a tweet back when our social media dropped this. And as uh, you may or may not know, depending on who you are on this call, if you're a member of PAFA, this is free to you. If you were a member of the general public, we asked you to pay five, seven dollars, I can't remember what it was, but, but something to help us sustain this work that we are still engaging in while we are working from home. And we definitely had a tweet that said, listen, I'd really love to do this and I get it, I'm from the art world too, but it's just like kind of unfortunate to see you asking for money right now. And if you think about the implication that seven dollars for art and conversations about art is somehow perceived as inappropriate already. I'm, I'm just, I'm not actually sure that 
Joan isn't right about the way that this moment is helping to solidify people's positions about what is, what is a luxury, what is an elite activity uh, in their hierarchy of needs. Right. They are unwilling to put art on the list. And I, I think that's something that we need to reckon with. And I'll throw the other thing out there sort of in response to that. Um, you know, I think a lot of us saw, there have been many things going around and like, are you an artist? Contribute this to this project. Uh, are you an artist? Um, draw something for the WHO that helps the WHO on a global level tell people how to do what they need to do better. What other discipline exists in which people think it is a privilege for you to do your work for free for maybe the right for someone to see it? There's no assumption that your work is inherently valuable in any of those, even when they understand that it's a, it comes from a skill that they need to do their work. They need the skill of artists to tell the message. They need Sue Ko to draw them a compelling image about why they should be socially distancing. But they don't want to pay for it. They assume that our world is just happy to be noticed. This concerns me, um, sort of as a long-term thing. Um, so, Anna, you want to chime in? Yes, I'm, I'm really thrilled that you brought that up. Uh, I was lucky to have a, um, a group Zoom with Michael Kaiser, who is the former head of the Kennedy Center. And his specialty um, is helping organizations in crisis. So he's helped multiple organizations that were about to go bankrupt um, turn themselves around. Uh, for example, the Alvin Alley dance group mm -hmm. he worked with. Um, and he met with our group of um, the Center for Curatorial Leadership to talk to us in this crisis. And something he said that was terrifying to him was the amount of free content that arts organizations were putting out. Uh, that includes museums, that includes operas, that includes dance companies, that includes orchestras. And that what he was worried about was that he understood the impulse, but he was worried that when we come out on the other side of it, people will expect that everything will be free right. and there won't be any value to mm -hmm. any of it. So, I, I, you know, I thought about that when I saw that we were charging $7. I'm like, oh, well, $7, you know, like, that's less than a cocktail. That was the <laughs> <You know>? logic. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we get to see each other and connect and it's, and it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I do think that that is a very real um, concern for, I mean, hopefully we can make the case that the arts do matter and we need to support people. We need to support artists. We need to support people who work in the arts. And unfortunately, you know, we live in a capitalist society, so there needs to be money attached to these things. Um, I don't know the answers, but I think it is a very valid concern in this moment where all everything is being flooded for free but i've noticed you know showtime and hbo are giving their their mm -hmm. stuff away for free for a month mm -hmm. and uh you know we're getting free historic movies every night <laughs> um like really awesome stuff but mm -hmm. capitalism is going to take that back and you know so yeah yeah. This is this is also a weird side note, but my world is lightly connected to the world of TV, um, just because of who we know here. Did you also know that they there's no TV being made? So what you've got right now is what you get because you cannot gather people together on a set to make anything. So there's there's also no entertainment coming that you were used to receiving in your home in that sort of way. So that's going to change too. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've got Nachama, if, we ha if you have your hand up, I'll try to unmute you. There you are. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. 
So um, I just wanted to point out, um, I'm a physician. I'm not currently seeing patients, but assuming that at some point I will answer the call when needed. And, um, and I understand the concern about artists being asked to do things for free, but actually physicians right now are actually being asked to volunteer even and, and do things, um, really put themselves um, in harm's way. Uh, you, you can't at, at all compare it to the HIV epidemic because it's, it was actually difficult to, I mean, I, I, I started my training in the 80s, so it was actually difficult to contract HIV. Mm -hmm. It's not difficult at all to contract COVID virus when you are working in intensive care unit or an emergency room. So there are a large percentage of doctors who are already intubated in intensive care units and will die as happened mm -hmm. in other countries. But mm -hmm. at the same time, and that doctors are being asked to make all these sacrifices, many are actually already being laid off or their salaries are being cut. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that you bring up obviously capitalism because mm -hmm. this is what apparently the market will bear. And uh, I don't know that the public understands that when this, if it ever is over, when they come back, there's going to be a whole different, um, it, it, it's not only the arts that are going to be different. Yeah. The, this is going to change medicine probably forever. Uh, and again, you know, what do we care about? Do we, do you care about, you know, obviously. Oops. Oh, where have I, you gone? I think we lost you. It's like we missed the end of the fabulous thought. Well, darn. But it's well, if you right. come back to us. Yeah, I mean, and it's a it's a point well taken. I think for all of us to remember, we're here because we also are concerned about the arts, but that is one sector of an economy and the risks are, you know, if you, if you look at um, one of the publications, it says, depending on what your job is, your, your level of risk during the, during this particular moment, um, artists are actually at the bottom of the curve because they work in isolation and they don't have to go out into the world unless they want to. Curators, not so much. Curators and educators and museum folks, we are too close to the public for that to affect us. But artists and loggers, I believe, were at the bottom of the bell curve because they work in isolation primarily, which I just thought was a weird, I've never seen loggers and artists united together in a, in a field before. Um, Kate, do you wanna Kate, yeah. add to that? add something i'm unmuting oh. i can also do this ah. <laughs> even though it's being recorded um so i want to kind of move in the direction of what the doctor brought up and talk about what our role as institutions should be to acknowledge the grief and the mourning that's happening as well um i think you're mentioning the complete absence of that during the AIDS crisis is important, but mm -hmm. what does that mean now? And I moved to a smaller institution where I'm actually running our social media. I'm sorry, I just got off the exercise bike again, so I can barely talk. Um, and I want to both bring works from the collection, the work we're still doing now, the work artists are still doing now, while also uh, holding space for the collective grief that I think all of us have, and not just have our public facing rhetoric fueled um, platforms be this place for either celebration or just everything is okay, everything will be as it will be. And this is not a, a form of thought, this is just throwing it out to the group who a lot of our museum professionals. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that I thought was really, think is really interesting about General ID and specifically A.A. A. Bronson is that in the in the 30 years since they were he was making the work about AIDS, he's since become a shaman and has actually been dealing in museums. He did these um, 
I think they're called like, like healing tents, essentially. So inviting people into these spaces to have these healing experiences. So I was thinking that's an interesting example of, of an artist that was doing work about AIDS 30 years ago and has come to embrace work about healing and mourning and grief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll say before we um, tag in Joan, who's raised her hand again, that so Papa works with healthcare professionals all the time. We do all of this really interesting work around training medical students and helping build empathy and emotional intelligence and physicians and all these things. And I was speaking with uh, one of our closest collaborators last week and I was like, hey, Dr. Blankety Blank, uh, do you wanna do like a Papa pours with me about you know, wellness and art, healthcare and art in the time of COVID? What, you know, sort of trying to figure out how we could merge this work we've done together publicly for people like you to enjoy. And she was very nice about it, but she was also very clear um, to the point that our, our colleague just made, who's not with us anymore, but, um, and to what you were saying, Kate, she was like, if you have the bandwidth to do this, what we need is a space to talk about how this feels. What we need is the power of art to help us heal when we get home from the ER. What we need is something to do with our kids when we can't touch them because we go to the hospital every day and we are for sure all contracting this really scary disease. What we need is the resources you're talking about, but not for your publicity benefits. If you have the time to do this, let's convene a networking group and you can give us the space to privately use art to talk this through. So that's what we're gonna do because sort of to Kate's point, I think what used to be a really great revenue producing program for me and a great moment of publicity for the education department, look how much the art museum works on empathy and emotional intelligence and other disciplines now is actually something we bring to the table that those partners need. And I think we should give it to them and I think we should give it to them for free for as long as they want, it. you know? Um, but that's just one, two cents. Um, Joan? I think that's, um, that's a, can you hear me now? Yes. It's a really good segue because what I was going to say is those of us like myself who are not an arts professional, just an arts lover, will remember what you're doing when we, when we come to write a check, assuming we have any money left, but we will remember that you brought this to us. So even if you're not charging or someone says, oh, wow, you have all this time, it's still, it's very important. If it weren't, I wouldn't be sitting here. Right. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. So, Abby, I am aware of the time. <laughs> I think she wanted to say something. Oh, I'm used to her managing me. Yeah. Uh, well, I wanted to mention just based on Kate, comment and Joan yours that I mean it's not it's not set in stone yet but we do want to use these conversations as space directly to address things like grief because museums maybe not always in our past like with the AIDS epidemic but can sometimes be spaces for tributes and times that we could physically come together to celebrate the lives of, of people we've lost and to have these difficult conversations so Basically, I'm just trying to say stay tuned. We have something planned directly addressing grief in the time of COVID with artists that we're hoping to have either next week or the following week. Um, so I just wanted to have um, reiterate how important that is because I think all of us are going to be touched by grief and art and these spaces are one of the ways that we can kind of work through that. Um, but I am aware of the time if there's any um, Monica or Jody last thoughts or, or things to share with people. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you for coming. I will say I'll close out with a statement that was meant to be a question, but we don't have time for it, if that makes sense. Um, one of my favorite things about this moment is watching not just how creative people are solving problems creatively, but how artists are finding new ways to also like create materiality in the art world yeah. that did not previously exist, if that makes sense. So, um, for instance, mm -hmm. um, take care of that real quick. Um, I don't know if all of you have noticed this, but like if you go on Instagram or something like that, the number of people painting uh, portraits or doing landscapes on squares of like Charmin Ultra, because it's now like, like, you know, it's like the best canvas you have at home and it's this precious other resource. 
it makes me think about some of the ways that artists found new materials coming out of the AIDS crisis in the 80s and 90s and started thinking about appropriating materials for a different reason. So I'm thinking like Jenny Holzer's condoms on which she printed things and Felix Gonzalez Torres and wrapped candies. Um, so one of the things that I know we don't have time for, but that I am super curious about moving forward is watching on a lighthearted level, the ways that artists start figuring out how to make sort of hashtag quarantine art using new stuff. Um, and I want to build like an entire um, shopping list around what artists have figured out how to make paintings out of and sculptures out of. I saw a photographer developing film with coffee because there were no more chemicals available. I mean, just the, in, the ingenuity that's, that's going into this. People painting uh, portraits on rocks because they didn't actually have any paper at home and then leaving the rocks around town. Anyway, I do think that one of the parallels is going to be some interesting new material realities about what we bring into the art world from our time at home being creatives. Um, and I'm excited to watch for that. That's the part that makes me smile when I go on social media. And I know Brooke's seen it too, because she's taken pictures of people masking themselves and costuming outside of her house, I think, walking around. So I know it's out there, it's everywhere. Um, so keep an eye out for that too. Toilet paper art as far as the day can take us. <laughs> Just something fun. So um, yes, we will let you all go. Jody, any last thoughts? Thank you. Nice okay. to see you all. You, Cheers. That was we'll see fun. you all again soon. Cheers. Thank you. Hey.